um, you know, if somebody's into screening and they want to learn, go find another person that knows how to print because yeah. this community is a really, um, generally this community is full of really good people that are, they're happy to share if they see that you're not a dummy and you're not trying to screw them around. And guys like that really helped a lot. And you meet them on the way up, you meet them on the way down. I mean, that's true of anything in, in, in the world. Uh, so, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, what do you do to get into it? You just gotta be curious and you gotta keep trying. Don't give up. And I wanted to talk to you specifically about your writing and how screen printing influences your writing and how uh, vice versa it may play out as well. Okay. I don't know. What do you think of those? <laughs> sure. Why not? I don't, <laughs> I don't care. You lead me along. You tell me to shut up when I get. I, oh, I, never. Well, first I, was, I wanted to know how your week went because you've been busy. Uh, this week. Let's see. When did we talk? We talked Monday briefly, and then you were playing, you were uh, Santa Claus, apparently. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I did two Santa Clauses this week, and uh, last Saturday I did one, and last Friday I did one. So all the ones that are listed are done. Okay. Uh, but I did. I, I kept the uh, suit because I'm. I'm kind of hoping it'll get warm enough I can go out on the motorcycle. So <laughs> I, figured, I figured I'd dress up and just go drive down the main street a few times, just for fun. If you had a caddy car, you could get someone to be your elf. If a, a which car? Sorry. The sidecar. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna let that phone go. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so I mean, I wanted to talk to you a lot about the various stuff that screen printers make simply because, you know, I make music and then everyone I know here at the shop makes something. So I just kind of wanted to get your take on that over the years, how that's changed. And I know you're that phone is persistent. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Oh my God. <laughs> I'll get it a second. All right. <laughs> but no, I wanted to just talk to you about the various influences that go into screen printing and how that's shaping up in the for the future of the end. <laughs> <laughs> could, could, you, could you hear that in the background? <laughs> uh, that was like the that was the longest voicemail take I've ever seen, and I've never heard that tone before. No, I never either. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, uh, okay. Well, anyway, well, it's, it's you know Canada, right? Like we're so <laughs> we're a couple of centuries behind up here. So, do you, you know. still have a, if you still have a landline? Then I I love you for it because I do. I, I have see, no cell phone either. Really? Yeah. Really. That must be. That's a whole. That's a whole episode on its own. Well, it's, I don't know, kind of interesting. I remember when we were talking on Monday, we were talking about uh, communication. And uh, I just read in the paper this way. I read newspapers too. But in the newspaper, the uh, U.S. government has introduced a bill to uh, go after TikTok. Um, yeah, they, yeah they've, been, they've been talking about that for months. And I know it was like a thing during the Trump administration. And then it got like put on hiatus. But it's, it's interesting because... I don't know as a marketing guy, I don't know how to what what attitude to adopt towards TikTok. I find it kind of creepy, but everyone loves it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like uh, it's like crack cocaine. Yeah, it's yeah, it to is, kids, it is. you know, like and uh, I, I they're all worried about them stealing information. I think that the 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 more worrisome thing is the dumbing down and the stupidity that it encourages because yeah. if that's all that you have in your life and that's what's influencing you to do things i kind of feel sorry for people who think that that's everything in a nutshell yeah and you're you're part of a dying breed reading newspapers i mean most people are scared of twitter going down as their news source 
who was it? Was it you telling me about the guy with the uh, the guy that they're going after with the uh, the crypto that, um, or maybe it was somebody else that said he said he won't read anything that's more than six lines long. Really? And I had no. The guy, I didn't the say guy that. that they're going after for everything. <laughs> and, uh, you gotta wonder sometimes, you know. But yeah, so with writing, you know, you you were talking about writing. I mean, I. I enjoy written communication and uh, I enjoy trying to get my thoughts down on paper and uh, try to say my poppy back in the day, you know, he gave me a bit of advice and he said, write to be understood, not misunderstood. And I think that that's uh, still critical in uh, our world today is if you are communicating, you don't want to be uh, shrouding your whatever you're communicating so that people can understand it you want it so that it's clearly understood and I find a lot of like with the instruction that we do um, a lot of people don't have reading skills very good reading skills but you they still want to learn and then the, on the other hand we have a lot of people I don't know what they call it in the states but ESL English is a second language and so if you're communicating in jargon or you're communicating, I don't know, just using like hip terminology or whatever, none of that translates very well. And so I think that um, clear communication is a, uh, it's a good thing. I mean, we should, we should encourage that. Definitely. And I, I want to ask how, how, if there's any tricks you've learned or anything that you've picked up that helps you communicate about the screen, screen printing industry to people that are new to the industry or new to the to the craft itself, because I mean you're not you wrote the the Ford for history of screen printing, which I have a question about in a few minutes because I I own that big that big book in my house, yeah. and then and then you've also written Squeegeeville, and then you have your podcast, uh, Art, Ad, or Alchemy. So a lot of what you do is communications about this. So <laughs> look at that. Uh, yeah, and and so apparently that's outmoded now, you know, the, the book. I have about 80 copies left, and we're probably not going to print it again just because of the expense. That's but, crazy uh, to me. Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I've that book came out of me running a shop and having to, we gave up on hiring people that knew how to print. Uh, and then we decided, okay, we're going to train anybody that we bring in to print. And so I started writing down what I knew at that point in time, which was, you know, I was probably 10 years into it. Um, trying to write out what I knew about, you know, basic principles in screen printing. And uh, uh, I think some of them still hold true. Uh, as with anything, there's changes. I mean, I look at that book and I go through it and it's uh, the last edition was 2003, maybe. Wow. And, and uh, there's whole parts of it that I actually would want to rewrite now because things have changed. I mean, that's 20 years ago. And, and uh, we've got, you, you know, there were just rumors back then of, uh, you know, direct to screen processing and things like that. You know, that was like really uh, modern shops or people that were on the cutting edge were doing all that. And now you look at, at most textile shops that are doing any volume, they're, they're, they've got direct to screen uh, term stuff going on. On the other hand, there's still all these people that are just starting out and do they have 20, 30 grand to drop on that? No, but uh, you know, I can show them how to make a screen using the sun and uh, you know, they can make a compression frame and away they go. See, that's, what's kind of fascinating to me because like I, I started my business back in 2013 for about 10 grand that I had saved for two or three years. And I was the benefit I had is I had been screen printing at that point for about five years, but I still wish I had a better grasp of the, the, not just the technical side of it, but the, the things, like you said, the jargon that is usually lost on most people, it's getting comfortable with, with the, the, uh, the terminology and stuff like that. And I also wish that there was something like that to impart on the next generation of makers and entrepreneurs that are trying to get into this. And I get asked all the time, 
well, how do you start doing this? I mean, I even asked Ed and Jay when I first met them and they said, well, we built up to it, but that's not very, that's not a lot of information, right? So I'm curious if you had to start, if you had to tell someone today, how do I start this from nothing? What would you tell them? Uh, I'd ask them first, what, what is it you want to do? Because if all they want to do is, uh, you know, print a couple of shirts at home or they've got an idea with a, a clever saying, uh, I'd probably tell them to go down to a local T-shirt shop and get it done there. Uh, yeah. It's going to be a lot cheaper. But if they're if they're driven to try it, uh, they can, you know, I mean, you can go on YouTube or you could we've got some information out there for beginners. And we've done a lot of uh, work around that online training. Uh, of people that have not a clue they've never done it before then maybe they saw it once and it's all like kind of almost home built equipment that you can get going and you can do one color shirts in the privacy of your kitchen or your your garage um and and that is still available to anybody but the problem is when with a lot of people they go into it and they want it to succeed right away immediately and uh, they find failure uh, and then they give up. So the one thing would always be like, never give up. You gotta keep pushing through it. And the one, the thing that we've found like, and I, I've done a lot of training through the years and we do like intro to screen printing courses. If you've got something like that available to you where you live, I'd go take it because that's gonna introduce you to that terminology and the, the different, um, pieces of equipment, but there's no substitute for getting your hands on the squeegee and printing, but you got to keep your mind open to what's going on because it's, it's like the, the motion and the printing. I mean, my granddaughter was five years old and she was printing. She a great printer. Uh, yeah. she, she listened and she always coming down. Oh, grandpa, what are you doing? You know, I had this shop in my basement and she'd always want to come down and print. Um, so she was able to get it. Now, could she do all this stuff? No, but the mechanics of it, uh, she could get. And I think that that's uh, for everybody. If everything is set up properly, it, printing isn't that hard, like simple right. printing. Uh, but a lot of people don't get to that point. They've, they've got, I don't know, they've they've learned this or they learned that or they saw this on a on a video somewhere and then they can't figure out why things don't work or when they don't work, they can't solve the problem quick enough right. because that's the, that's the other thing about screen printing is, I mean, it's just a series of problems and the better a printer you are, the quicker you're going to, you're either going to head the problem off by not, not allowing it to happen. Or if you see it happen, you're going to know pretty quickly why it happened and, and then correct, correct the problem. Yeah, it's and it's it's also a messy craft too, so that acts against you. But I, oh, yeah. I wanted to, but I wanted to kind of get into how there's also this distinction I think you were trying to make where just no, having the equipment doesn't give you a business necessarily. It's not the it's not as though it's a one stop shop and you come in and suddenly you're going to be a graphic artist and a t shirt provider for oh, yeah. your region. You know, so I was, I'm curious, like when you started taking orders, what were you geared after? What, who, who did you find success with initially and why? When I had my own shop, you mean, or? Or yeah, I guess when you had your own shop, because I, like, I wanted to say, like, uh, we talked a little bit, what, I believe it was you that said, you know, you were working with uh, musicians and stuff that would come to you and you were a musician at the time too so it's kind of tapping into that community yeah that to, right? to an extent i think that the uh see when i started i started with a book from the library because the people that i worked for i had another i was a graphic designer for them and doing uh newspaper ads and uh signage for their shows like hand lettering signs for the windows we had five retail stores but they yeah. wanted show cards and this was pre-digital. So the only way to make show cards that they could put up on a display, repeated ones, was to screen print them. And so I, I got a book and I kind of figured out how to do it. But I, I was lucky because we had a 
supplier to us who was a screen printer. And he had like, when I went there, it was like, oh my goodness, like all this really cool equipment. And he did all this really good work. And I ended up, he jokingly offered me a job one day and I was so fascinated, fascinated with the process and not really thrilled with making ads for the newspaper. I took a job with the guy. So I basically apprenticed in a shop and you know one shop led to another led to another led to another so that was my introduction so i was lucky to have people to kind of show me what was going on did they really know not really in hindsight but um i was pretty analytical and i was always curious i used to read screen printing magazine religiously it was like uh i can't i i so i work for the magazine now and i have for years uh, writing for them but when i was a young pup up in edmonton in the middle of nowhere man i get a hold of that magazine and read it cover to cover and uh that was a place where i picked up a lot of information and then uh i got inducted into this academy of screen printing technology and all these people in this academy were the people that i learned screen printing from through reading about it and I was so thrilled. I was just like this little kid that went into this room full of these giants, you know, and I, I couldn't even believe I was there. You know, it was, I still don't, you know, some of these people are so, you know, they're so smart about what's going on and they've done such incredible stuff. And I, I think that there's a point, um, you know, if somebody's into screening and they want to learn, go find another person that knows how to print because yeah, this sure. community is a really, um, generally this community is full of really good people that are they're happy to share if they see that you're not a dummy and you're not trying to screw them around most people will help you out i had people that you know i had one guy he says listen uh you know we're getting a new tabletop on our on our big vacuum press uh if you come by the alleyway at about four o'clock you can get this four foot by eight foot vacuum tabletop because i was into building stuff then and yeah. uh, sure enough there it is loaded in the truck i made a big one-arm printing table out of it to print four by eight signs <laughs> so That's you know and, and guys like that really helped a lot and you meet them on the way up you meet them on the way down i mean that's true of anything in 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 the world um so but yeah i don't know uh what do you do to get into it you just got to be curious and you got to keep trying don't give up well, nowadays, there's so many things you can get into. I mean, we've talked a couple times now about where we think the future of printing is going and, and printed electronics and stuff. And yeah. I'd love to yeah. kind of see how that develops. But I uh, I was listening again to the Dan Styles episode you did on your podcast recently. And I wanted to check with you and see if you had talked to him in the last few weeks or anything about what he was working on. No, I haven't. And I, I mean to all the time. And I always forget to get in touch because we still have, uh, we had done the printed light thing with the electroluminescent as an experiment. We got it to work, but we ran out of time. So I still have all that stuff and we're still wanting to do our Tron poster. And I need to get back in touch with him, find out like, when are we going to do this? Yeah, explain explain a little bit about what you were trying to do with uh, uh, you call it a lamp, a printed basically a printed light source. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And do so I have that right? it's a, it's using uh, electroluminescent materials, and you're really what you're doing is you're 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 creating a circuit, uh, and you're placing between the two elements of the circuit uh, some materials that when electricity passes through them, it'll light up. And so you print these layers and you separate one from another by printing insulation layers and then a certain thickness of material, these specialized materials. But then when we took the two electrodes from our little battery pack and put it on it and turn it on, boom, the thing lights up. And now you see this in use in a lot of, uh, they're using it more and more like you, you see it in cars uh, where they're not using LEDs like that. That's the easy way is to use an LED light. But yeah. um, this way you can actually print the material. And so um, we're going to see more and more of it in um, 
just uh, you know electronic devices that will light up under a small bit of power and um right now it's kind of a novelty thing but there's more and more people using it all the time and and so like all of this printed electronics i mean it's everywhere every thing in my non-existent cell phone is full of printed electronics uh, every touch screen has uh, their capacitive touch uh yeah. materials that are printed and uh we did the capacitive touch uh with dan we did a poster for jack white and so it was a, we did a regular poster run of a, i think there was 300 pieces for a show in north carolina or south carolina but then about 15 of them we printed this uh this material on it and he turned it into a a theremin so you could actually play the poster uh you with your hands you know you just run your hands like this and you could control yeah. the volume and the pitch and it had a couple of it has a couple of switches you just tap it and it would switch but this was all printed it was all flat printing on it hooked up to electronic bits and pieces i mean there was a speaker and there was a little amplifier and there was a control uh knob to turn it up and down and it was all mounted in the frame that it came in but it just to show what we can do uh and part of it the people that helped us is a, a little plug it's called creative materials and they make a lot of this this stuff and they sell it to all sorts of larger industrial printers who make products but nobody had the reason they helped us is because we came and said well we want to do these already stupid things and they went <laughs> okay that sounds cool <laughs> so, <laughs> so they got involved with us because they said that any of their customers are all working on kind of hard applications you know like that are oh we're going to make this into a product we're going to make a million of them we're going to sell them here or there this is a functional piece of some bigger product that's being you know a jet airplane or a car or whatever uh yeah. whereas this was just art art for the the sake of art which was really you know it's kind of cool and i, I think i mean it speaks yeah. to it speaks to the viability of art <laughs> yeah and you, you know ai isn't going to do that for you you know yeah. you can speak i can speak into here to whatever that program is and say you know make me a theremin uh you know make me a poster that acts like a theremin or make me a poster that's going to light up it can't do that you need humans right. to do that you know like and, and that's the thing and as we go further and further into this electronic world people have to remember that people if you have a device somebody had to make that device somebody had to make the device you know just because you can go down and buy it at the store doesn't mean that somebody didn't make that device and and i think that that we get back to this idea of the maker spaces this is where people are starting to experiment with making things again locally and, and so, i think that that's uh this is good yeah we've thing. talked about yeah we talked about that at length because it's interesting the the COVID kind of provided all these supply chain shortages that affected nearly every industry so and it and it affected nearly every business around the world that i could imagine i don't think anyone was spared of the effects of COVID but um as far as staying local what are some of the local f projects that you're taking on right now well for us locally uh i i mean the main thing that we do at, at watch a studio where it's, you know i'm kind of retired from there but i still go in every couple of days uh we print a lot of shirts and these shirts are done for local artists who have developed lines of clothing and we've also spun off quite a lot of businesses that came in to learn to screen print from maybe they were artists themselves but they wanted to do their own printing and so we support a lot of places as well uh, by making screens for them maybe they don't have the ability for that we supply inks to people in the area we supply the schools with uh you know material that they need whether it's frames or they need emulsion or something like that and uh like for one one instance uh, the local high school here when my kids went to that school which was quite a long time ago uh the art teacher knew that i was into screen printing and she really wanted to get screen printing happening there so i helped her get going and we got their shop to build some vacuum tables 
and they ended up getting a four color press and a bunch of stuff. And it's continued through the years. She's retired. There's a new fellow there that taught my grandson who went there as well. And this guy, he's the art teacher. He's got this, they're called, uh, I can't even remember the name of it, but it's a, it's a program that they run with the grade 11s and grade 12s that it's an integrated program where they have screen printing, but they have design, they have woodworking, they have 3D printers, they have all this stuff. And the kids wow. are encouraged to make products. And so they're making skateboards there. They're making, they just make all sorts of things, but they're learning how to uh, create packaging for them as well. And, you know, printing on, maybe they make, they sew up little bags or something to hold products. Uh, and so this, this course is oversubscribed. You're on a waiting list if you want to get into it. And, and the kids wow. are just getting into it. And, and I think, you know, that kind of encouragement uh, to encourage younger people to, to like, hey, you know, you got an idea. You can actually make this. You don't have to get somebody else to do it. You don't have to give you want to do a shirt. You don't have to give your art over to Redbubble and have them do it. You can actually print this stuff. And so we've got we've got one customer. Uh, they're called West Coast Karma. and it's kind of. Uh, I call it nouveau hippie. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Can you see yeah. that? I this got you. Yeah. Years, but it's it's a hippie death cult. Great band. I like of, it. They're they're right. They're out of Portland. Um, anyway, she's a younger lady. Got a couple of kids, and uh, you know she started out. And I, I think it's a story that we hear over and over again. Uh, she came to us and when she started, she was doing, you know, three of this, six of this, and they were like, uh, Hannah designs, you know, and it, uh, there's lots yeah. of stuff there. So she did this stuff and it was very, uh, attractive to people in that 20, 30 age group. And she got a little bit better and a little bit better. And her runs started going up in size. So now when we do a run, we're doing 200, 300 of a design. They have at least 40 designs, different designs that they do that are in our shop. And they just don't, they used to work from their house, you know, to sell the stuff. And uh, they've got a store downtown, you know, like a bricks and mortar store now. And they're doing, her husband who had a really good job, he quit his job to work full time on this. They ended up buying a house. You know, they were renting a house before. And, wow. and she's, she is so typical of, younger people that get into making things and 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 then selling them learning how to sell and they it's a it's an ongoing lesson all the time and i, I think that they do a really good job of marketing and i know uh, i know this for a fact here i'm sure they will never hear this because this is out of the us and stuff but okay they, they were doing really really good and then uh in probably February, February of 2020, just before COVID got crazy. Yeah. I remember her husband coming in and he, he gives, he gives me a shot in the arm and he says, check this out, mate. He's an Australian guy. And he's showing me, they got this order for about $60,000 worth of uh, wow. stock from this chain of stores that they'd been supplying and uh, it'd been going pretty good. And then COVID hit. And that store canceled the order, but they'd already ordered in all the stock and we were halfway through printing it all. And they canceled the order on them because everything got shut down up here. I don't know if it happened there, but the malls all got shut yeah. down. They were freaking out. And I said, well, write them a letter. These people got money. Tell them, you know, you've been supporting them, you, you, but they need to support you. And they did. But they also pivoted and really got into online sales, which they hadn't done much of before that. Okay. They exploded with that, and that wow. that fueled that fueled everything. From I'm sure that from, probably worked out better than the initial deal. We never know what's going to happen. You just got to keep going forward. I, I mean, I think that that's a lesson for if you want to learn screen printing, you want to do anything in life. You know, like don't give up. Kind of figure out what you screwed up on, and then try not to do it again, and just go back in the water. <laughs> Yeah. Andy, it's always great talking to you. I wanted, I wanted to, I hope you get a chance to show uh, your science projects to that, to the school nearby, because I think that'd be great for them. And I want to see it still. Yeah. 
Well, you can go if you go on. I, I think if you go on Jack White's uh, Instagram page, that theremin still, is on yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Maybe, maybe you can you can link when you put this thing together. You could link to that so people could see it. And they they demonstrated it. it demonstrates really well. Uh, but yeah, you know, like all these things. I mean, there's so much that can be done, and uh, we're just scratching the surface, really. And does is screen printing going to go away? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Uh, it's it's funny people always say print is dead but then it's it's still written in print yeah the problem is people classify print as uh words on paper and yeah. we are so far past that now you know the print is everywhere on everything in everything and uh but unfortunately the definitions haven't caught up to it or kept caught up because you find the education system go, oh, yeah, print, it's dead. We're not going to teach anybody anything about that anymore. Everything's on the computer. But it, it, it's a problem. And uh, in our industry, the worst problem we have is finding people that can discover print or screen printing and want to get into it and want to get into it at a higher level all the time. And uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's tough. It's really, really tough to find people. And I, I know probably at your shop, um, you would get people coming in there, but a lot of on the job training is required to bring people up uh, to learn the equipment, you know, because the equipment is so much more sophisticated now. Um, yeah, the, the equipment is sophisticated and then there's so many different things that you can accomplish. I mean, we talked you were talking a little bit earlier about direct to screen and how that's really advanced as an emerging technology and then. You have direct to garment, which is inkjet printing on a garment, and then the various advances. It's it's it makes it easier for operators, but it also gives a certain level of versatility that I think is 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 good to have if you have the experience and skill set to take advantage of it. And you have to have the clientele though that can you know like it, yeah. if you're going to get a if you're going to get a digital head on an automatic press first off with an automatic press you got to have enough work for it yeah uh, you can't have it sitting there you can't afford that and then uh to be able to put the digital into play you have to have clientele that are going to buy that kind of stuff and uh the world is littered with people who bought digital uh you know direct to garment printers but couldn't make them pay and couldn't make them right. pay in enough time before they went obsolete or broke down. And that's a, you know, an issue around digital that I, I think, you know, people don't, that's the story that none of the digital guys tell is that, you know, most digital machines will, they won't last more than five years. And by the end of the five years, they won't communicate with any of the drivers that will, that make them go. And yeah, uh, you can't repair them. You know, it's not like a press. You can, you know, we've got 20, 30 year old presses. You just repair a bushing here or there, put a new squeegee in it and away you go. But uh, you try and replace the inkjet heads. Uh, it's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's a headache that you can't simply just master. There seems to be so many constituent parts to that technology that. Yeah. It, it, it's that's the kind of the chasm between digital and screen and screen or digital and analog is that having your hands on the equipment itself and having your hands on the materials is your your safest bet to ensuring the quality of a product to the final product it's yeah but i mean that gets back to your local maker spaces um yeah i know i didn't really you know kind of answer the question on that but uh, there's one of those podcasts, or actually there were a series of them. We, we interviewed uh, a fellow that they're making. The, it's the world's biggest makerspace up in Brooklyn uh, called okay. Powerhouse Arts. Massive big thing, but screen printing is a big part of it. And then some friends of mine in Oslo have this incredible facility over there, but it started out of screen printing. And it's still, you know, screen printing is a big part of it. And um, I think that there's places like that springing up all over the place where they, you know, it's common tools so that you don't have to go out and buy everything yourself. And then you can find people that know how to run the tools or make things. So you come in with an idea and they'll help you, you know, work on it. And I, I know the local maker space here, 
they saved our butt when we were doing all this electronic printing because we, we didn't have a clue what we were doing once the printing was done. But it <laughs> so happened that they knew how to they knew how to program the chips in, in these, uh, uh, you know, the drivers that we were using. And they helped us get the uh, just the conductivity worked out. Uh, so that was really good. And it was uh, a great thing to see. And so I think for, um, you know, I, screen printing has a place in that, too, because uh, the one thing that I see screen printing doing is they can take a product, you know, where maybe you make something, but you have to put some labeling on it. And so what's your choice? You know, you, you go and you, uh, you know, photocopy something or you print something out and you stick it on the product. It looks cheap. But when you print mm -hmm. a thing on a product, it looks like a real product. Yeah, and it does so, you know, and we find that, you know, like a, a guitar headstock, you don't won't see a Martin guitar with a, a stick on sticker, you know, like it just doesn't happen. Right. You, They're going to print directly on that or they're going to inlay something in there. And we've got a local guy makes snowboards up here, wooden snowboards, and he sells them all over the world. Uh, but he started printing. Uh, he prints and it looks beautiful you know um he prints it himself yeah yeah wow okay yeah he was uh he That's brought he came, in, he came in with some veneer one day and he said can you print on this and i said yeah sure so we printed a few samples and next thing you know he took a little course with us and then he's he's set up out at his place now and he's he's printing he's got tons of his own screens now and um because they were doing an inlay, but any time that they got really detailed things are multicolor, they couldn't inlay it and it would take too long. Mm -hmm. And so now he can print. And so he could do a, you know, somebody needs a logo down at the bottom or some image on it. He can print that in like half an hour. He's done, you know, he's done 30 or 40 of them. Uh, whereas <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, is he using, is he setting the screen by hand or does he have a rig or? Yeah, he's got some kind of jig and he, he fits them in because he's doing multicolor work now. But okay. he, prints, wow. he prints the veneers before he assembles the snowboards. And there's lots of people that were doing skateboards that way too. Uh, I set up a couple of skateboard factories where they were, they would print the veneer first and then assemble the board. I got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah, and, and so now maybe it's it's just easier if people want to do super multicolor stuff to, to make a sub die transfer and then transfer it on uh that's going to be a, a quicker way to do it but there are you know some people like the idea of screen printing it and then there's other people that are doing short runs of craft built and they want to do all this stuff themselves and so they they can they can print on a board what i love printing wood i think printing wood is the uh one of the things that is unexplored uh, what about it? Why? Because it, it takes the ink really well and it looks okay. very organic when it's done. It's, um, it, I don't know if I've got here. I was going to say, what kind of ink do you use for wood anyways? Well, we use water base a lot, but, um, you know, here's, here's a couple of things that we've done. This was just... I don't know if you can see that there, but that's yeah. just um, where <laughs> there we go. You know, this was just given out to all the kids, the First Nations kids in the school district. It's kind of a little grad present. And so that's we went through and we actually we actually cut the wood out of these uh, planks that had come out of the woods from a down tree and then shaped them. And then we did 1600 of these. So we were able to print that, but here's another one. And this is a, I don't know if you can see that. So that this beautiful. box here, so that's, that's just a, a clear print on there. So you can see it kind of as a ghost. And then there's a three color. Nice. So this is a traditional, these are bent, that's a bent wood box, which is a traditional box that they would make here, the First Nations people. So, it, but, but the, print itself just looks so good on it and i i think from uh you know we're in british columbia here one of the big industries is, is tourism okay. uh and 
So what's more BC than a piece of wood? And of course, you know, just a piece of wood is nothing until you put some image on it. And uh, the reality is they burn wood around here. Like they just, you know, they scrap wood, they just throw it out uh, and burn it. And it's kind of crazy. But um, I think that there's lots of opportunity to take small pieces of wood or things like that. And you with a, somebody's image, put it on to it. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, the fact that it, you're... You, whenever I talk to you, I'm constantly reminded that it, there's more to printing than t-shirts and, 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 yeah. uh, and posters. So the fact that like you can just manipulate wood or you can manipulate it, you can print on glass, print on metal. The whole world is kind of open to you as, as a source of material <laughs> as a substrate, at least. Well, that's one of the jobs we're printing at work right now. And this, this job, it started before COVID. It came into the shop wow. and it was, it was a guy who, <laughs> Years ago, I'd helped a guy who was restoring old gas pumps and they couldn't get the glass globes for the top of the pumps. You've seen that like from the 20s, they used to have these yeah. round tops. But all the glass was broken. So all the people that collect cars, you know, the Jay Leno's of the world, uh, one of the things that they put in their collection or in their garage is they'd put these restored gas pumps. So this guy was restoring gas pumps but he couldn't get the glass. So he found me and he said, listen, this is what I want to do. So he came and we figured it out. And so I showed him how to print the glass. And then he uh, made what they call a slump mold. And so it was a mold that was curved and they would print the glass, lay it on and then put it in and fire it. And the, the glass would melt into the shape. So he, huh. he, he started a whole business around that of these reproduction uh, tops. And then this friend of his, who's a, some kind of antique dealer, he was talking to him and he said, oh, yeah, that Andy guy up there, he knows how to print glass. So this guy showed up one day and he wanted to do clock faces with uh, Orange Crush, you know, like the, okay. the, the, in the 30s and 40s. And I guess in, you know, lunch counters and places like that, there were lots of these metal clocks, you know, with the metal surround, but they were all they all the glass got broken through the years. And yeah. so there's the reproduction ones, but they look kind of fakey, not very good, done on plastic. He said, could you print a reproduction of this uh, Orange Crush? And I said, yeah, sure. And it took till now for one reason or another, you know, to reproduce the art and then get it all going. And then we had to find the inks because I didn't have any inks available to me up here. Um, we found some old uh, enamel inks that they used, and then uh, we started worked on the art. And then we had to get it so that it backlit properly because these would have the bulbs inside and light up, you know. And it had right. a clock mechanism in it. So he found somebody, cut us the rounds, drilled the centers, and so we got twenty of them almost complete in the shop. And I keep procrastinating to put the last color because <laughs> I have to flood coat the back. And I okay. want to make sure that it really, really clean. We went through, we had little touch-ups we had to do on some of them because of dust. And uh, uh -huh. so, but anyway, the, you know, there's a glass thing. And my, my big fear is that they're, re they're really nice and he likes it so much that he wants to do more of them. Because, <laughs> that's, that's every I, screen printer's biggest fear in reality. Yeah, I, I don't really want to do more, but, <laughs> but anyway, you know, yeah, you can print on anything can print anything on anything more or less it's, yeah more or less it's going that way um well, we, yeah and, printing humans you know i mean um again I go what? Back to the, the, the ad art and alchemy we did a whole uh episode on live printing and then we and that was just about like going to flat stock shows or going to events and and printing a poster or something or printing yeah. a shirt but these crazy Greek guys that I know from Tind, it's a T-I-N-D, uh, and Tind stands for this is not designed. And they're a father and son screen printing team from Athens, not Athens, Georgia, but Athens, Greece. Okay, good. And, Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, and they do live printing, and there's some video, you can go look it up at Screen Printing Magazine. Um, 
but they they made um, they got body paint and then mixed in uh, uh, fluorescent inks into them, and they would be hired to go to parties and events, and they would set this up and they would do live printing on people. And so they're huh. basically printing tattoos on their arms or whatever. Yeah. But under a black light, they would fluoresce and look really good. And then the other thing that they did was uh, they would do this fundraiser every year. They would print crepes with chocolate. And so they, they had print a print the chocolate on the crepe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they were putting some image on it and then making the crepe and then selling it to people and people are reading the crepes. So it was kind where of they, where they get the sort of safe emulsion. I want, I want some printed crepes now. Well, I don't know how, I mean, it's only what's the worst that's going to happen. <laughs> I know. Right. No, I'm not actually worried about it, but it, that's how, that sounds great. Someone actually did ask me about printing cakes once and I did not know that. that well, they, was a do thing, that. But, uh, they, they do that. Yeah. I mean, there, there are, uh, I think that there's emulsions that you can get that lock in so hard that they don't give anything off. Right. And, uh, you know, nobody's died yet. So <laughs> And do it now, kids. <laughs> don't go. Yeah. This is this is not inviting anyone to go try print cakes with the hopes that they get sick and have a, a lawsuit yeah. or something on their hand. We, yeah. But I, uh, but yeah, you really can print anything, and uh, it's like I said, it's always fascinating talking to you because you get to see so much of what's going on, and you have just access to all these great people who do it, all different kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah, it's a big about. community out there. I mean, look at your two guys, you know, like I know them from 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, was, I've been meaning to ask how you met. How did you meet Jed and uh, Probably Jay and I got in touch with them through gig posters, the old famous gig posters.com. Don't go there now because it's a, okay. It, it's no good anymore. It just turned into a crap site. Gigposters.com before Facebook and before all that stuff was this uniting force that all these people that were doing rock posters or into rock posters or that kind of art uh, somehow got together. And it was a site, a fellow up in Calgary started it. And uh, and then all these people were on it and we would stay up all night, you know, yapping on the, the, the forums and stuff. And. Uh, at the time, you know, I had my book out there and I was helping a lot of people. And, but I also worked, we used to sell really large screen printing presses. Uh, they're called One Arms. And um, uh, Jay got in touch with me and he decided that, uh, you know, they had their textile shop going, but they decided he, he wanted to print really big art prints. And so okay. they bought. Uh, an exposing system and a press the press the print bed was four foot by eight foot and the exposing okay. the exposing system would do frames big enough for that so they were you know they were like six foot by whatever and uh yeah so they um they paid the shot and we shipped the stuff up we made it in mexico shipped it up there got them going and uh, I remember actually going to the shop and I, I got little, I got video of Jay printing on this thing. He's hanging off the arm, you know, and kind of trying to put the weight down. And I, I think that they worked their way through that and realized, yeah, it takes up a lot of room and we're not doing that much with it. And then they ended up getting the Thema clamshell, which I think was yeah. more in line with what they wanted to do. Uh, I remember doing a trade show in Atlanta one time and we shipped our booth to your facility just so I didn't have to pay the, the bandits to ship it into the, uh, the nice. center. There. <laughs> and, yeah, I got uh, you. yeah. And I got, he was working on, um, yeah, I went out for, uh, we went to a really nice Mexican restaurant with his wife. And I remember she gave me some advice too on, uh, she's an editor or something like that. I can't really quite remember what she did, but. Yeah. yeah. Nice people. Really nice people. And Ed, you know, he's Boston guy. Right. And I think right around then they, they beat the Canucks in the playoffs and oh, was okay. them off. he was gunning me off. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know what? Boston it's been great sucks. talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I was trying to avoid it. <laughs> Andy, it was great talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. Okay. For yeah, you. for sure. 
for sure. Yeah, definitely. And everybody, I don't know when it's coming out, but um, hi, everybody. And uh, yeah, keep your squeegees sharp and don't take no for an answer. Hell yeah. Andy, okay. you have a good one. Have a good holiday and I'll be in contact with you. Okay, sounds good.